This case study is a really great example of everything that you should do when you want to present a project. Now, case studies like this one are great to show clients or potential clients what your work is like, what you can do, and what you can actually bring to the table when they're looking at hiring you. Now, I see a lot of portfolios with people just showing their best work and their prettiest work, like you'd see something on Dribble. but case studies like this is great to get started when you wanna get hired by a company. Now, we're gonna get into every single part of this case study here, and I'm gonna explain what you need when you're showcasing a project. Now, let's get into it. Now, when you're showing a project or when you're diving into a case study, one of the most important things to do is to outline what the problem is and what solution you're bringing to the table. So one of the most important parts of when you want to get hired as a designer, as a product designer, UI, UX, web, dev, all that, it doesn't matter. The most important thing that you need to do is tell clients and show clients exactly what they're getting when they're hiring you. And part of that is the very pretty side of it where you can show them what the final design looks like. But what's more interesting to someone that's hiring like myself would be to get into the mindset of what problem did you solve? How did you get into it? and how can it help me? So we can see here in this example here, which as I said, is really great. I'll leave a link to this portfolio in the description so you guys can check it out on your own and read and take your time. But the first thing we see here is outlining what the problem is. Now, I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but we're outlining the problem very first thing, and then we're diving into the solution. And we have an option here as a link. If we want to, we can go ahead and see what the final solution actually looks like. But one of the first things that we're doing here is we're trying to suspend this problem and then the the solution. So we want to show that in the very first thing. Now, after you get into that really quick introduction, you want to start talking about what the brief is like and what your part of this case study would be. So are you doing the creative direction? Are you doing the branding? Are you doing the web design? Are you doing only research? Are you doing the copywriting? That is a very important thing to talk about and to show in this case study or in your case study. And in this example here, it kind of gets into that a little bit. So we see some focus areas into what we're going to look into in this exact uh, case study, but we don't ac actually see what we're going to dive into. But it's also very important to showcase, as I said, like the roles that you do and what you actually brought to the table if this was a real project that you did with multiple other people. Now, part of the project here is going to be having the actual brief. So you want to take a deep dive into what are the actual problems, what is the actual brief of the project and why this problem is even important in the first place. Now, part of that, part of the brief and part of diving into the actual problem is going to be actually understanding what the problem actually is. So we can do that with a couple of different methods. Number one is going to be showing different different types of research that we showcased. So in this example, right in front of us, we see a survey. So we see that there is a survey displayed in front of us. Now I'm going to say that this isn't the full survey that, that this person did. I'm sure that there was more research that was done, but we're only seeing a very nice polished version of that. Now that can be a good thing and a bad thing, a good thing because Obviously, we don't want to showcase everything in a project that's unrelated and that's not really relevant, but we might be missing some critical points that I might be interested in and you might have missed. But apart from that, it's a great way to just take the most important bits of your research and outline it in this graphical manner. And in this case, we, do, we see that with a survey. Now, next up, we also see user interviews. So we see this person actually going out of the way, talking to real people, whether it's through Zoom, through Slack, through Telegram, Facebook, whatever it is, or even in real life, which is scary, I know. But it's important to also get those user interviews and talking to people and going outside and understanding what people might actually take from this problem. So why is this problem even happening? Who are the people that are most affected by it? That type of problem, when you're showcasing it in a case study or a real project or any type of portfolio piece is gonna be critical because you're showing what the actual users are, who are they? And we'll get into personas and things like that a little bit later. But this type of user interview is super duper important. Now, again, here we only have a small quote from those interviews. So we can see a smaller version of that, but it's also important to showcase some interviews or even showcase that you did interviews in the first place. Now, competitive analysis is obviously important, right? It's the idea that you're taking your potential project, your potential product, and you're seeing what else is out there, what else is in the market, what else exists. And this person, they did a, a small version of that. And ideally, we'd want to see something more advanced than this, right? Maybe have a massive map where you're comparing the different price points and the different complexities of the actual product. But this in itself is good just to showcase that you did think about it, that you did get started with that. And maybe you, you want to flesh it out a little bit more later. Now, when you're getting into the actual research, it's super, super important when you're actually showing all the research that you did, it's super important to be able to showcase that in a manner that is easily legible, that won't confuse the person that's reading it, right? For this example, me, and it won't be too overwhelming. Now I've seen portfolios where I've seen maybe 10 pages of just research in a PDF manner. Now that 
might work maybe in university or maybe if you are in an agency and you're just showing it to someone that you're working with. But when you're presenting it in your portfolio, you want it to be almost like a final piece in itself. You want it to be a great way to showcase that research so that the person that's actually reading it or the person that's looking at it won't get too confused. And here we can see what we're looking into here. We're, we're looking into different behaviors, different needs and pros and cons of current things that exist. And so this would be very easy for me to read. So I can look at behaviors and then how users use apps to find and save restaurants. Okay, there's four different types. Google Maps, then there's Yelp, then there's Instagram, and then there's reservations through special occasions. And within that, we see that there's different parts within those individual sections. So this is a great way to just talk about what the actual points of the research are. And we can see a small key down here that explains it a little bit more. Now, this is also an option. If you don't have time to do this, then you can do it a little bit more quick and dirty like we have here. And I'm sure this is just a Miro screenshot or something like a Fig Jam screenshot where you have all the user stories lined out or the interview notes. And then you just take a screenshot of that. And that's also okay because we can see that the work went into it, but it just wasn't presented in a portfolio manner, but that's also okay because at least we can see what exists. So we talked about persona and personas are important because we get to see who this person would be, who the actual user would actually be. But one of the cons that I see a lot happening with user personas is that people tend to get stuck on maybe the imagery or the very silly parts of it where we, we kind of get too enthralled with, I want to create a user persona, I want to create the, this person, but we're not actually thinking about, okay, what are, what are their actual needs? What are their, their goals that they want to actually have with this product and why does it actually matter? And so thankfully, this person did a pretty great user persona. Now it's a brief one. It doesn't have too many goals and frustrations, but it does get into it and that's the most important part, right? We're not talking about this person has this friend and this friend and they work in here and they do this and do that. We're talking about they want this out of this app. They want to have these capabilities and this is their current frustrations. One of the things that's important from these interview notes and the reason why they're so important is that you take real life human beings with problems and needs and then you take those user stories of those interviews which are extremely valuable and you create ideas out of the little snippets that they told you and so it's your idea to go ahead and pick up small parts of what they said and why it might be important for the project and create a user flow or user experience out of those little snippets out of those ideation little points that's your job to take and then digest and think okay this might be something that other people are struggling with this might be something else that we need to look into and so you take that and do what's called a user flow now we can see a very basic one here where we have the primary user flow is a process of searching saving and sharing with friends so we can see that this is a very simple user flow of one of the problems that the person had or one of the basic elements of the app and we can see that this is easily done with something like figma or even figma jam if we wanted to this is probably done with fig jam actually we can see that the the arrows are very figma-esque but this is an idea of what you want to do and ideally something that i'd like to see is okay we have a user flow of what you get into with this application but maybe i want to see more about the smaller parts of the app that you talked about or that you found in the interview and what are the most interesting parts of that and how can we actually create something more from that but this is a great way to just have a brief version of that so after you have all of your user flows done and you have an idea of what your app is going to be through and through, you want to start getting into the low fidelity sketching or the low fidelity designing. Now it's funny when you think about it because designing for me and for you and for everyone, it's the idea of going to Figma, creating a rectangle, creating auto layouts and having fun with this whole project. But it's everything else that we just saw in this portfolio. That's the majority of design. And then everything else that comes after is a very small part of it. It's a very small portion. And usually get started like this, or if you want to, you can jump straight to Figma and do very low fidelity as well. That's also fine and then go into a more advanced, more high quality mockup like we see here. And we can start seeing some icons and some text, even though it's uh, placeholder text and we can see what the app is going to start to look like. But we can't get from here without sort of starting to understand what the app is gonna be first, right? We need to start doing low sketches first before we can get into the really high, adding images, adding colors, adding all those things. We need to understand what the app is gonna be first. And that is what this case study is showing me, that they thought about it first, and then they went into Figma or Adobe XD or wherever it is that they designed this in. Now here's something really interesting that I really appreciate from this case study. In the end here, right before we get into the actual design, part of it. We say that there's a small study on the design that they just created or the mockups that they just created. So one of the things that I see here that not a lot of people do is they actually reflect on the design that they just did. And here we can see three different pain points and then new ideas on how to battle that. So we can see source of restaurant review was unclear. And I'm not sure if these are directly related or if maybe one and three are related. I'm not sure. I would guess one on one. But the idea that this person wanted to reflect on their idea before going on to the design and showing that to the user 
is a great, great idea because obviously when we're designing and we think mm, that might not work, I need to change that up a little bit. You do that, but you don't actually take note of that. You don't take initiative to show that in your portfolio. And that's an important thing to do because obviously it shows that you're reflective, that you're thinking about the actual project that you're doing. And then you get into the design or then you get into the mockups or whatever it is that you're doing. So in this case, then we have the design. This person also did branding and typography and all that, which is great. And then here we have some high fidelity mockups. So you can see that in the end, this is what you skip over. It's not that you skip over it, but this is what you end up appreciating for a moment, but you really want to digest everything that comes before and then you go into the mockups quickly. So here I'm just scrolling past to say, okay, profile and list. Yep, this looks like an app. This looks like a great app. I mean, it's six images and a piece of text. And in my mind, it's it's easy to do that. And it's, it's a simple idea, but I know now that everything that came before that has led to this point. And that's the benefit of showing everything before, because if not, then you're gonna get lost in the sauce and it's gonna be difficult to explain to people why this design being so simple that it is, is such a great idea or is is the right idea in the first place, depending on the user stories and the, and the journeys and all of that. Now, lastly, after all these designs, we have problems solved. So we have six main problems that this app solved when competing with Yelp, Google Maps and all of that. So we see that it integrates all the needs into one streamlined experience, suggests more personalized restaurant recommendations. Now, I don't know if Google Maps and Instagram and all that already doesn't do that, but the point is that this person has managed to showcase all these problems that they've solved in the end of their portfolio, in the end of their case study as kind of like a bow on everything. And you can see that there was a point to all of this, not just a cool design project that they wanted to do and mess around in Figma in. So that's an overview of what a great case study looks like in the first place. Now, if we wanted to dive deeper into this, we could add more sections. We could add more smaller pages that intertwine within each section. So we can dive more into, for example, the user flow or maybe user stories, and we can learn a little bit more about the pain points of users, or we can learn a little bit more about this or that. But as a standard, this portfolio is fantastic. It shows me that one, this person is reflective with their design and their problem solving. And two, they're actually aware of main problems within the app world or within the booking world. And it shows us that this person knows the process of creating an idea to implementing it with a high fidelity mock-up or design or even building it if they wanted to. And so if it was up to me, I would obviously hire this person to create an app for me, but that's not necessarily the case, but whatever. Now there's one caveat that I wanted to talk about before ending the video. And it is that not every single case study or not every single portfolio piece needs to be a case study. And the reason being is it's also very much okay to just have six images that outline a very pretty design. That's also completely fine. The only drawback is people might not fully understand what the design is about because you didn't go into the actual case study, you didn't go into the actual thinking that got you to that design. But it's also completely fine to treat your portfolio or your website as a as a gallery, right? A lot of people do that. If I were to have that type of portfolio, then I also would probably do that unless I wanted to go into case studies, but maybe not. Point is, it's also completely fine to go the opposite direction of this, but this is what a really great case study would look like if you had that in your portfolio. If you guys enjoyed this video, please do leave a like and subscribe and comment, do all those things. Share this with someone who might need a case study like this one. And let me know if you guys did enjoy this kind of video. I do wanna make more videos just like this one. So again, if you enjoyed it, then obviously let me know. Thank you guys so much for watching this video and I'll see you guys on the next one.